Hey everyone, so it's the end of the day. This is the end of my day and it's been a good day. Today, Melanie and I were able to decorate our house. We were able to go through all those boxes and pull out some of those decorations that have beautified our house around Christmas time uh, each and every year. You know, the funny thing about it this time is we normally do not allow ourselves to decorate until after Thanksgiving, but this year we changed our mind. And I think that that's a good thing. You know, but as we were putting all those things together and I was going through all the ornaments and remembering some of the things that were around what was happening the year we got those ornaments, it really got me to thinking and, and I guess in some ways reminiscing. Reminiscing about so many different things, but also it made me just really appreciate home. And, you know, sometimes I think I feel guilty about that. Because sometimes I think I'm always supposed to be out there doing something else. And during this time of pandemic, I've been forced to be home a lot more. And maybe, maybe I don't need to be always out there doing things. Maybe there's other things I need to attend to. Well, all of this stuff has been kind of coming together. And I, I started thinking about, um, about purpose, okay? What is our purpose? What is our ultimate purpose? What is it that we have been called to do? And, and as I was reflecting on purpose and what I'm supposed to be doing and, and all of that, I, I really started to think about what happened right at the beginning of this pandemic. I don't know if you remember it, but right at the beginning of the pandemic, we started talking about what is essential and what is non-essential. Do you remember that? What jobs are essential and what are non-essential? What travel do we do as essential or what is non-essential? What kind of support do we get or care do we give that is essential or non-essential. I started thinking about that. Was my job essential? And if it was essential, what parts of my job was essential? Was what I did with my leisure activity, was that essential? Was the way in which I spent time with others, was that essential or was that non-essential? Was it essential with how I spent my days? And I remember also thinking about, is the church essential? Do you remember that? We were talking about that. We were talking about, is it essential? Is the church an essential or is it a non-essential thing that goes on in our world? I mean, we knew grocery stores were essential, right? And we knew that our, our police and our firemen were essential. And we knew, we knew that uh, our hospitals were essential. But are our churches essential? I remember us talking about that. And if our churches were essential, what part of our church was essential? I mean, did we have to worship in person? Was that the essential part? Or could we worship online? Could we have meetings on Zoom? Or was that really essential that we met in per person? Could we make telephone calls and send text messages and send cards to people? Or was it essential that we physically visit them? And there's been a lot of arguing about all of that because we really struggle with what's essential and what's non-essential. What purpose do we have? And are we living out that purpose? Again, in the midst of all this, I was reading this uh, devotional by Richard Rohr. And I've, I've, I've known of Richard Rohr before, but I've really been reading him more lately. And in this particular uh, devotional that I was reading, he was talking about the purpose of our spiritual journey. And in the midst of talking about the purpose of what we do as Christians, what we are called to do as Christians, he wrote this. He says, I think the real purpose of the spiritual journey is to expand people's ability to do good by liberating them. This is what Jesus did after all. He freed people from their pain, their sin, their uncleanliness, and even their deaths. Then, he said, and this was the part that really caught my attention, then Jesus sent them back to their families and to the society to live in relationship and live lives of freedom and wholeness. You know, that really caught my attention because here's the thing. Whenever I've thought about following Jesus, I've always thought about those disciples. Remember, Jesus said, follow me. And what did they do? They left everything behind. Remember those disciples? They left it all behind left their nets behind, and they followed him. They left everything behind. And is that essential to what it means to follow? And I read this thing by Richard Rohr, and it really got me to thinking. You know, oftentimes, 
Jesus didn't have people leave everything behind and follow him. A lot of times, Jesus sent them back. Remember the story of the woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years? After Jesus healed her physically and called her daughter, he sent her back. There's a story of a blind man who was healed, and rather than Jesus even telling him to go and show himself to the priest as they normally would, he sends him home. Go back home. There's a story of the woman at the well. Remember that story? She comes out to the well, and she meets Jesus there, and Jesus teaches her about what it means to have living water, and she begins to believe that he's the Messiah. And then what does she do? She goes back to the village, and she shares, I think I found the Messiah. Jesus sends her back into that community. But I think maybe my favorite story is the one that happens to the man who was demon-possessed or uh, was struggling with psychological difficulties. It's actually told in all the different Gospels, or three of the four Gospels. But this particular story comes in Luke chapter 8. And in that story, Jesus goes and he encounters this man who has been kicked out of his city and is living uh, out in the, among the tombs, living outside the city because they've kicked him out and they've chained him up because they're so afraid of him. And Jesus comes and he sees the man and the man comes after Jesus, but Jesus heals him and Jesus makes him whole. And in that moment for this man, think about it, he's been kicked out of his home right? He's been kicked out of his community. And so at the very end of the story, Luke chapter 8 at verse 38, it says this, the man from whom the demons had gone out begged that Jesus, that he, excuse me, that he might be with Jesus. He begged him, let me come with you. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So the man went away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. You know, here's the thing. Yes, sometimes it's true. Jesus called people to leave everything behind. But oftentimes, very often, Jesus sent people back. He sent them back to their homes. He sent them back to their communities. He sent them back to the village. He sent them back to the place that they had come so that they could share their experience with those friends and family and community that needed to know about Jesus. What is our purpose? You know, oftentimes I've thought about this and, I, and I've thought, you know, oftentimes God just wants me to be out there. He wants, he wants to send me out there. And yet sometimes I think there's things I got to do closer to home. And maybe God's not calling me all the time to leave everything behind. Sometimes I think Jesus is calling us to pay attention to what's happening at home. Pay attention to what's happening right there in front of you, in your neighborhood, in the immediate community in which you live. Because that is where you can proclaim your wholeness, perhaps greater than any other place. So, as we go towards these holidays, I know you've probably been spending a lot of time at home, but begin to imagine that place as a place of ministry as well, because Jesus doesn't always call us to leave home. Sometimes he sends us back. Thanks so much.